everyone's fond of saying that coastlines and forest distributions and all this stuff are fractal. Well, doesn't this imply that there is then a global fractal? There is a fractal dimension which when you feed it into your computer and wrap the data around a sphere, the continents and oceans of Earth should appear. And in principle, again to the absurd level, you should be able to then telescope in on that portion of this data that is wrapped around the sphere that corresponds to Northern California. And on your computer screen should appear Esalen hung on the cliffs of Big Sur with us sitting in a room inside discussing the matter. Rupert, Terence, I'm Ralph. Creation, imagination, my mask is chaos. early LSD experiences, I seemed to see uh, motifs and structures that gave me an interest in uh, Tibetan Buddhism. And I went to India with the intent of studying the Tibetan language and quickly found that the whole thing was just overwhelming and that I was just, you know, a human atom in the sea of India. And, that the notion of uh, encompassing or understanding what this was was clearly uh, the task of a lifetime. And several times in my life, I have acted out this sort of ricocheting relationship between the humanities and the sciences. At times, you know, losing myself in the study of certain schools of poetry or literature or painting, and then at other times spending years reading philosophy of science and epistemic uh, basis of physics and this sort of thing, always trying to get a resolution on the content of my experience my lived experience, which included the psychedelic experience, which for me from very early on was this kind of tremendous uh, mystery or conundrum which was set down in the middle of my being. And it still continues like that. I keep returning to that, testing all the ideas against uh, against the fullness of experience. The main difference between our world and the world that science tells us we're living in is that science denies the quirky, freaky, cosmic giggle high plottedness, completely improbable, totally quirky humor that binds everything together and that makes it something other than an engine in which atoms blindly run, in, in Whitehead's phrase. Schrodinger brilliantly anticipated uh, the discovery of DNA and then Joseph Needham and L.L. L. White and, uh, well, Eric Yonch should be mentioned, actually, as a precursor of us all, I think. I mean, Eric Yonch was a great pioneer, a great soul, and he saw very deeply into whole systems, as did Ilya Prigozhin, the Belgian thermodynamicist. And I think uh, a lot of all of what we're doing comes out of that. What Prigozhin showed that just brought down the house was that 
there could be uh, perturbations of physical systems that were unpredictable and that would cause the whole system to actually move to a more ordered state than the initial state. And this perturbation to higher states of order looks suspiciously like a violation of the uh, supposedly inviolate second law of thermodynamics. So that looks, you know, like a, a doorway into a, an energetic hyperspace. Well, when uh, A New Science of Life came out in 1982 in America, it came out a year earlier in England, um, I came to California because it was published in Los Angeles. I found myself here at Esalen. I found a, an extraordinary new range of things going on I hadn't known about. And when I was in San Francisco, uh, a friend who I knew from Europe said to me, just the day before I left, um, there's somebody you must meet. Uh, he's called Terence McKenna. I didn't know much about <laughs> Terence, uh, so I went up there um, and in this large 1956 Buick, we headed off into the woods in uh, Sonoma County, where Terence lives. And there I met both Terence and Ralph, who was there for the day. I found that uh, part of my interest in these other realms of reality, of course, like many people in this room, was stimulated by experience with psychedelic substances. Um, this was before I went to India. When I arrived in India, I found that India is a kind of psychedelic realm anyway. You know, it's, it's just an amazing place. So, in Terence, I found somebody who knew about that whole realm, who shared with me an interest in India, since it played an important part in his development, and who had views about the nature of reality which complemented my own in an extraordinary way. My own theory is about memory and habit in nature. Terence, I found, had developed a theory about novelty and creativity in nature, a theory about the quality of time and the creative process uh, as it uh, is related to the ongoing flux of events. Um, and Ralph uh, had a kind of mathematical theory which was just the kind of thing that the view of nature I was trying to develop needed, the idea of nature being drawn by goals or attractors in the mathematical science of dynamics. There's this uh, model of, the na of reality being pulled from ahead by things called attractors. Um, it's a teleological, animistic view of nature, uh, which dressed up in the guise of mathematical models, um, which I found most fascinating. And so for me, the meeting with Ralph and Terence was a step further towards seeing how one could begin to dream of a world in which nature was seen as alive in which the imagination permeated all reality, in which animals and plants are seen as part of the um, living uh, texture, the living, the living components, the cells in, in the life of Gaia, and Gaia in the life of the cosmos as a whole. In fact, a view of the world uh, as alive, which recalls in some respects the old cosmologies of the ancient world, where the cosmos was seen as a living organism where they thought of the whole cosmos as having a soul, the soul of the world, the, the anima mundi. So I was uh, brought up in a field of music, but I was attracted to mathematics early. And when I was 14, I played in the State Symphony. And after that, I started in mathematics. And I became a professor at Berkeley when I was 23. I had an easy way in mathematics, and the, the way the uh, system works, the carpet is unrolled in front of you. You know, you, can, you have a few choices, but basically before you even know what's happening, the carpet is unrolled, and you've, you're down the runnel into whatever you can do that's useful to the system. In this process, I, I lost uh, nature. But there was a great gain because I love it out there. I love to be off the planet. I always did. And uh, to this day, I spend very little time on planet Earth. So it went on in this way. And by 1967, I was a professor at Princeton. I had written three books on 
mathematics that you need a microscope to read. <laughs> and I had been studying for a long while chaos, but we didn't call it chaos then, and we didn't see in it any role in the natural world or in social transformation or in the evolution of consciousness because we didn't think about anything out there. So one day after my third book was done and I was exhausted and I looked up and all the students were out in the courtyard demonstrating about the Vietnam War and to open the university to women students and, and so on. I said, what exactly is, is going on? Here they said, take this. <laughs> 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 and so, like many people in that year or around that time, in 1967, my uh, career had a bifurcation. So I went off the track with uh, psychedelics, with meditation, but especially with searching, with trying everything, and uh, eventually I was living in a cave in the Himalayas. And when I returned to California, I was standing on a street corner in Santa Cruz, in white pajamas, and a car stopped. An old friend from a previous lifetime said, there's somebody you have to meet, get in the car. <laughs> I had nothing to do, it sounded okay, and in that time, I believed that everything goes perfectly. You just go along with the flow, as they said. I didn't know it would be a two-hour drive, so I got in the car, there was the two-hour drive to Berkeley, and I was literally dumped out of the car on uh, Terence's front step. I never heard of Terence at that time, 1972. Mm -hmm. And I went in, and what happened then, I would still say, although we've had many wonderful talks and exciting, thrilling, and nutritious times in the meanwhile, that that was quite a miraculous chat. Many subjects came up. How to grow mushrooms, outer space, I don't know, anything you could think of, all passed by in the course of an hour or two. In this way, we became friends, and this habit we had, this activity that we do, I mean, we never go for a hike or something like that. We sit in the evening and, and talk, and what happens is synergistic, uh, miraculous growth, evolutionary. And in this uh, revitalization of my work, and eventually the whole field of mathematics, my conversations with Terence, whereas I think we thought of them as just good fun, that they did have a really fundamental influence on everything I've done since. So fun, or I would say fun is insulting. I mean, thrilling uh, because of going to the edge, going beyond the edge, having company there, finding things which you can bring back and they work, and become part of everything you're doing. So it's opened up these complex uh, phenomena characterized by chaotic irregular, that is to say not well ordered in the previous paradigm of space-time structure. For example, relationships among people, the states and change of states of society, the whole process. Uh, the intimations of mysticism <clears throat> the intimation of a possibility of transcendence is all firmly grounded. We just have to now, it's almost as though mathematics is the extreme cutting edge of human understanding. How can we quickly export these new understandings that release us from a need for closure, that free us from an either or universe? How can we quickly export these models from the realm of research mathematics into the realm of, uh, of daily life. I really see it as politics, almost at the viral level, that we are trying to create new languages and new concepts, and not only create them, but teach them to you and we ourselves repeat them over and over again and you feed back into this and then we refine the mean and then a mean is like a gene it can be replicated and we have not seen language as the playing field of uh, the creation of the new paradigm but that's really where it is we can transform ourselves no more quickly then we transform our language. And the way we transform our language is